Hi everybody, you might have noticed I've been missing for a little while, out of action. And here I am, the original battered woman. <laughs> no, I haven't been beaten up by those student protesters. I had a cycling accident in New Zealand, fell off a little bridge, which was rather sad, and broke my collarbone and some ribs and slashed my leg in half. <laughs> anyway, we're doing well. But the really sad thing is all the people who want me to come to New Zealand again, um, I think they're out of luck because the previous time I was in New Zealand, I was caught in the earthquake in Christchurch. So that's it, folks. I'm staying home. Um, and sadly, that means I'm actually not going to go to the um, conference, uh, the ICMI conference this year, because um, it's going to take a while for my collarbone to heal. But I'm very happy I'm back on deck now, sort of, and I'm here in Parliament House. Uh, speaking to Mark Latham, um, who's a real hero of mine because he's one of the very few politicians in Australia who's been speaking about, about what's happening to men in Australia for, for decades now and taking on all sorts of issues which no one else wants to mention. Well, hi, Mark. I'm very happy to have you here today. That's great to have you here, Bettina, <laughs> in the New South Wales Parliament. We've upgraded our lodgings. Oh, you sure have. So congratulations on a big win. Very nice to see you back in Parliament, in New South Wales Parliament now. And uh, just for the people who don't know, um, Marx, of course, was the leader of the opposition. And he was in the federal parliament for a long time and now is in the New South Wales Parliament. And we have very good times we're seeing with our extraordinary victory in the federal government. Yeah, well, Actually. that was a sign that the public's not going to put up with nonsense. And, um, you know, I ran for the state parliament because a lot of these issues, uh, uh, problems of uh, leftist infiltration, the march through institutions, a lot of it's at state level, through the schools. Uh, state government's still got um, controlling legislation for universities, what they're doing wrong in the domestic violence space, demonisation of men. Uh, I think that while there's a lot of publicity about these issues out of Canberra, we've got to focus more at state level, because these institutions are huge, oh, particularly okay. in the school system. So is that one of the that's one of the reasons you made that? Yeah, shift? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, particularly in the schools. I mean, if the, the, they can run programs like respectful relationships in schools and safe schools, trying to indoctrinate young people, that's a that's a danger to the future of our society. So having people in the state parliament who are pushing back against this nonsense um, is very important. I think it's critical. Yeah, I was very pleased in your main speech. You talk about our whole idea of male privilege and you know the what it's like to be a, a work you know an unemployed bloke in <laughs> living in a housing estate somewhere in New South Wales and the, you know to explain what you the point well you're I, I was making the point that this talk of white male privilege is a myth yeah in that uh, when I first got into parliament out at Campbelltown the typical uh, person in need of assistance uh, from uh, uh, the Labor Party was a uh, white guy being restructured out of manufacturing in the 80s and 90s. He was in a public housing estate, yep. plenty of those in Campbelltown, and doing it tough, probably issues at home and, and struggles on all fronts. And, you know, I made the point, how silly was I? I now find out he was an example of white male privilege. That's that, right. uh, I think the quote I used was that the backside out of his pants was actually a rainbow shot up his backside. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he was supposed to be on Easy Street. So this whole... Uh, um, you know, classification of people, these broad gender and racial categories, they don't stack up. They're a very poor way of judging need in society. And it's still true that for all the talk about minorities, the smallest minority in society is the individual. And a lot of uh, white men as individuals are doing it tough in society. And the fact they're now wiped by the left, they're ignored in the quotas and the affirmative action programs, it builds a lot of resentment because they say, well, I've got huge needs in my life, but on the basis of uh, race and gender, things they can't do anything about, Others receive preferential treatment. So for social justice, it's an absolute disaster. Yep. And the white men are the bottom of the barrel when it comes to handouts, aren't they? Well, and, and at the same time, a lot of the tough jobs um, in, in society, you know, there's, there's no employment quota for doing the garbage run or working in no. sewerage works or the people who go fight the wars and put their lives on the line predominantly are white men. And, and all the risky jobs. Yeah, the risky jobs, the dangerous jobs, uh, deaths in the workplace, the construction jobs. I mean, it's still um, uh, men doing them. Absolutely. And uh, they don't receive any recognition for that. And those risky, hard, 
uh, dirty and dangerous uh, aspects of work, they're still classified as male privilege. It's ridiculous. And of course, the, I know you've spoken out about the lowering of entry standards into the services, the army, the air force, the fire brigade, uh, fire brigade police. I was, I was at a cafe yesterday and two police women walked in and one was a big burly woman, which is fine. The other one was, you know, tiny woman. And the thought of that woman trying to rescue someone else, it's just inconceivable. Or, yeah, or well, hauling her yeah. injured colleague out of harm's way. or It just wouldn't happen. Yeah, I, the, get, the, I hear from the, police yeah. across Australia. Yeah, and fire brigade yeah. uh, just as much. Because the truth is uh, that the entry standards and training standards have been lowered yep. to allow women in. And, you know, it's causing um, disaster. It's putting so-called diversity ahead of public safety. Because if you're on the third floor of a burning building, you want someone the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger to run up the stairs, not, <laughs> not a, a small 65 kilo woman to drag you to safety, of course. And nature, whether the lefties like it or not, nature has made men stronger than women, yeah. all other things being equal. So to put uh, diversity and gender ahead of public safety is high risk stuff. And one of the things I'm, I'm doing here, I'm already I'm, I've asked some questions in Parliament uh, about the folly of employment quotas in the New South Wales Fire and Rescue. So this is uh, wrong-headed stuff and will unfortunately backfire at some stage. But can I just say that for women who on merit, according to their strength and ability, have gained sure. employment, they resent this just as much. Because yep. in the workplace, the women who got there on merit uh, are labelled with, oh, you're, you're an employment position, you're a quota position. Yep. And they resent the fact that, that uh, these gender uh, quotas and categories have been applied when they've got in on merit and they've got to wear the odium that others have got because they didn't get in on merit. So it's very unfair on the women who got the job, uh, you know, according to the, 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 the system of merit, not the quotas. Yeah, I hear from them a lot. Now, I want to go back to, Mark, the, you out there fighting the good fight around domestic violence long before I even really became very public on this issue. And, in fact, one of your big breakthroughs was to actually dig out the statistic about the actual amount of physical violence, women, which was, I think, 1.6% 1. 1. Yeah, or something. Yeah, it was minuscule. That once you dig into the surveys and you look at the actual results, then you're talking about Tiny a very small percentage. fraction of the population. And then when you break that down, yeah. um, for every incident in a middle-class uh, suburb, there'll be 15 in a public housing estate and 25 yeah. in a remote Indigenous community. So this idea of patriarchy, that every man dominates a woman, every man's at risk of violence, every man's got privilege, is just a complete nonsense. That the main driver of um, uh, violence of any kind, domestic, non-domestic, is um, socio-economic circumstances. Yep. And, you know, the lefties exploded once when I said that for people, not just men, for people in desperate situations of poverty and despair and breakdown in their life, Violence becomes a, a macabre form of coping. It's a coping mechanism to um, uh, try and exert your dominance over others. That's just the social reality. Now, the fact and that the left... And of course, it's usually towards other men. Well, usually towards and other men. But, but to other women. Yeah, yeah, to the people in your life to try and, re, you know, re-establish yeah. your self-esteem by dominating others physically is a sign of, of socioeconomic despair. Yep. And, 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 and these, this is all borne out in the statistics. It, it, you know, you look at the Boxar statistics in New South Wales, the crime stats, it's undoubtedly true what we're saying. And the fact that the left can't even accept these things, yep. they always say they know better and they try and apply their faulty theory of patriarchy is a sad reflection on these people. They're trying to apply and impose ideology on the circumstances of women in need instead of looking at the real life circumstances and finding yeah. a solution accordingly. I mean, that Bureau of Crime, that's the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics, it's got a lovely map, mm. which we yeah. might include here, yeah. which shows the incidence of domestic violence across New South Wales. And it's just glaringly obvious that, you know, it's so much less common in fancy suburbs like St Ives than it is in, as you say, Indigenous communities and, and, and rougher areas of Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And nothing beats an evidence-based approach. What you're talking about, what I've been talking about, is purely based on the evidence. And the fact that the, the, the left apply theory and ideology just shows they're not interested in evidence and they're not after real life solutions to this problem. And if, if, if they're diverting resources to middle class areas instead of getting stuck into the real problem, the coal yeah. faces in uh, remote indigenous communities, then of course they're leaving those women vulnerable. And, and, More vulnerable and the than they should be. interaction with the other factors like drug and alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. Where there are proven interventions 
where you can help people who are particularly likely to, to not be able to deal with, with conflict in their relationships and to end up in violent relationships. Men and women, of course, that's the other side. Yeah, but the ideologies become so pervasive <coughs> that even people in authority in the law and order system run this uh, nonsense. Now, look at the circumstances of, you know, the tragic murder of uh, Courtney Heron in yep. Melbourne, where the police officer comes out and says, all men have got to change their behaviour, implying all men are responsible. Yep. Then we find out she was homeless, the alleged perpetrator is homeless. It's a clear circumstance of socio-economic despair. And, and, and jargon alcohol. And, 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 and to say that a, a man like me living in Sydney is responsible for the actions of a homeless man in Melbourne is just ridiculous. And I've got to say, a lot of men resent this. Absolutely. Because ultimately, the, 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 the people responsible for these horrific actions are the individuals who did them. Yep. And to try and demonise all other men, and the police must feel compelled to go out and say this nonsense, is, is, is not only defying the true nature of the problem, making it less likely to find a lasting solution, it builds resentment among the men who are doing the right thing, who lead a non-violent life in the home, have always done the right thing, and to be tagged up by some um, police officer in Victoria makes you think, well, all this is just um, uh, ideology pointing the finger at me when I've done nothing wrong. So, Absolutely. you know, there's millions of men in Australia who feel this way now, and if these feminazis think for a moment they're advancing their cause by building resentment among good men, then they're off on another planet. But you've been part of the political system for many years now. I mean, for instance, when you were leader of the opposition, presumably there were discussions around these sort of issues. Not what? Really, no. Not really. The you gen never... Well, I, I, fortunately, I got out of the Labor Party before the virus of identity politics took full okay. hold. There was a movement to get more women uh, in, in the parliament for the Labor Party, but not uh, moving into the domestic violence arguments and talk of so patriarchy. Been... These, these are all developments since I left uh, federal parliament yeah. in, in, in 2005. Okay. And if anyone had said patriarchy back then, I would have thought, well, you're joking, aren't you? I'm the member for Wera representing all these needy white men in public housing estates. You're an idiot. Out of, get yeah. out of my office. Yeah. So it, it, it's something that I, th I, I trace more to the Gillard prime ministership, that the whole patriarchy argument seemed to gain pace and it was almost like them compensating for Gillard's historic then, failure as a female leader, the first female prime minister. So they went into overdrive in these arguments and it's been their narrative ever since. And then Rosie Batty, of course, was, was appointed Australian of the Year, who's a tragic figure because her son was killed by um, the, 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 ex, father, uh, yeah. the yeah, father the ex-partner of, of the child. The father of the child, and, yeah. And that was the most extraordinary scenario that... Here was this woman with this tragic circumstance where initially she spoke out with great compassion about the, the fact that the man had loved his son and he was had a men, you know mentally ill and so on, and then she was captured uh, by you know the feminist orthodoxy, and from that point on she never spoke publicly about mental illness. She never you know she just said, gave the party line. It's all men. It's all to do with gender politics. Yeah, yeah, she said more, men are born that way. I, I assume these were speeches that were written for her because, in, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think she was really exploited uh, by the left feminists in that here was a woman in her moment of personal anguish yeah. and grieving and they grabbed hold of it and make push her forward and say, you know, here's the, here's the example that we're talking about and it applies right across society. And, you know, Rosie Batty was saying things as an Australian of the year that all men... Uh, are born that way, you've got your lens of privilege and it's how you look Teaching at Teaching little boys to be violent. You and, know. you know, they really exploited her grieving to push her forward to say these things and none of them were valid. Um, but, it, again, it was an example of ideology triumphing over, uh, over evidence. And people told me that in private seminars she'd still talk about the other issues but never publicly, the mental illness. The well, health. yeah, and, yeah. and it, it mm. was really part running, running with the herd and, and this right. became their narrative and they used her for that purpose. But in the, the tragedy of her circumstances in setting up the Luke Batty Foundation, I have documented this on, on, on the Mark Latham's Outsiders fake mm. Facebook page in great detail, that she was, um, uh, you know, quite um, robust in her dealings with other women and ultimately that foundation yeah. had to close down. You yep. can see all the details on the Facebook page, and I don't, I don't want to sort of, you know, go into it in any, any, any great length. But clearly, Rosie Batty wasn't in a, uh, and, and no person would be in um, a state of mind to handle all of this 
um, the way it, you know, um, uh, people who haven't been grieving would handle the matter. So they really used her up. The foundation had its own problems in, you know, disrespect of women and had to be closed down for that and financial reasons. So uh, grabbing a person in their moment of uh, grieving and trusting them forward this way wasn't fair on Rosie Batty and it certainly hasn't been fair in finding yeah. solutions in the domestic violence issue. Well, if we talk about solutions, I mean, how do you propose to help get the New South Wales government to take to address this issue properly? Well, they're wasting money in funding outfits that just have a view of patriarchy. They're just to demonise men, to play gender politics in, instead of finding solutions. They waste their money funding White Ribbon. They waste their money funding domestic violence New South Wales. Our Watch, New South Wales has joined up and it's wasting its money with Our Watch. Because this is all ideology. It's all dogma. It's all essentially some kind of uh, political hatred of men, big really. Pro big and propaganda a, and a, machine. A propaganda yeah. machine to demonise yeah. all men. Instead mm. of realising the best solution to any form of violence, domestic or non-domestic, is solving poverty. If you can solve the socio-economic problems of people, build their self-esteem, their confidence, their regular contribution, they won't feel the need to assert themselves and re-establish uh, control and self-esteem in their life well, by engaging in violence. So the best solution is to solve poverty. And as long as they're off on this other ideological tangent, uh, they're wasting a lot of money. Well, I don't think it's, I, mean, I think it's a bit more complicated than that because I mean, we have actually very good evidence in Australia from Kim Halford, who's a professor of psychology at Queensland, who's done a lot of work with young couples, looking at where, whether, when they're violent in their relationships. And he finds just as many women will acknowledge initiating violence as the men will. Um, but it's about not being able to handle conflict in relationships. Well, it's that. And, and that but see, when you but, have but women... also conflict are taking over large parts of their life. Conflict yeah. becomes a way of life. Yeah. But and, I mean, and there was a very good report that Boxer... If we, if we Boxer... taught them, Mark, I mean, we need to start teaching people about how not to resort to violence, women as well as men. And that's what they're well, doing in some places absolutely. But overseas. I mean, but the thing that I, I was struck, you know, there's, there's a Boxar report uh, reviewing the coroner's report, uh, the coroner's findings in New South Wales, yeah. all the circumstances where the domestic violence ended in, 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 in death, murder, effectively. And it, you read those case studies and they're a case study of poverty, of drugs, of yeah. alcohol, yeah. of multiple partners, of instability. Mel mental illness. Mental illness. Yeah. I mean, it's just a entire uh, mix of yeah. uh, life failure yeah. and you read it and you think wow how do people ever get themselves in this kind of circumstance and it's a mile removed from the theory of patriarchy of and, and middle had, class so suburbs. We had people, and, we had people you know, at the, new, you know, the Victorian Royal Commission, we had some of our good experts talk, saying precisely that. Uh -huh. It's this complex mix of these social problems and jug and alcohol and they were all totally ignored and that whole whitewash of that report. Didn't fit the narrative. No. Didn't fit the narrative. And well, even, even ultimately, ultimately violence is a byproduct, uh, a tragic byproduct of, of these other life circumstances. So you've got to address the core problem. And the amount of money that's, that's put into domestic violence as if TV ads or so-called education campaigns will make it. There's not a single example of government TV advertising changing anyone's behaviour. No. You know, never, ever. And, um, you know, they're really just wasting money on propaganda. That's right, because it makes them feel good. What happens when you talk to people here at Parliament House? Have you talked to well, other Well, I'm just Parliament? starting up. I'm yeah. starting up on this. Um, Do you ever hear, I mean, there must I, I, think, I think there isn't a way. A lot, of, uh, a lot of members of Parliament know the sense of what we're saying, but they're too scared because of the environment of outrage, being shouted down, political correctness. So, you know, we, we need to just put the facts on the table, I think, and get good people to respond to them as legislators and as decision makers. So I'll be engaging in that, but you know, I, I think anyone who looks at the evidence knows the, the it's a long process. knows the truth of what we're saying. But the outrage industry is powerful because they convince good people who know the evidence to, to bite their tongue yep. and not speak up. And, and you've copped it, I've copped it. We're here, you know, because maybe our our our, our skin is thicker and we can <laughs> handle it. But we're the we're the we're the you know copped it society, and we're. we're yeah, the sort of people who will speak our mind and maintain the evidence and truth, but others quite, quite well, not at that I, You know what's interesting? I've been thinking about they must get, have focus groups on domestic violence. And, you know, they go out and ask people, are you in favour of protecting women from violent men? And, of course, everybody would say 100%. And they never say, well, 
do you believe in protecting families where the children are at risk from their mothers? You know, they don't ask the broader questions and therefore they, they never get the answers which would say we need to take a broader Well, but the government-funded agencies with those focus groups would never release those results. Instead, no. they have these broad brush, brush surveys asking women what's happened to you over the last 30 years. Yeah. And they redefine the meaning of our language to turn violence into things that are plainly non-violent. Like, um, he, he wouldn't Financial give me... Financial abuse. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't give me access to the a bank account. He drove the car funny one day. Um, he, uh, there was a shouting match. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I had a feeling I was being dominated. All these sort of concepts are now rolled in to be domestic violence. It's like yeah. sexual harassment now is looking at a good-looking woman or a good-looking yeah. man, part yeah. of nature. So, you know, part of their technique is to bodgy up the survey findings by redefining the common meaning of our language so that mm -hmm. things that are non-violent are defined as violent. Things that are non-sexual uh, uh, or uh, directly harassing are defined as sexual harassment. So that's the, that's the trick they engage in and it's a fraud, it's a waste of public money and it's a fraud on the problem that they're trying to solve. And it's corrupting our justice system. I, I had a, a retired um, chief inspector of the police speak on one of my videos recently who came to me saying he's just so fed up with seeing what's happening to the police force where they're forced to go in and when people women make accusations of violence to use as strategy in family law cases and they can get the man turfed out of his house denied contact with his kids i mean it's all for advantage in when it comes to, to marital separation and here are these poor buggers the police having to go in and they're and they have to listen to this woman tell lies, even though half the time they know it's a, all a yarn they're being spun. Um, anyway, he, I mean, he gave me the most fascinating interview. Yeah, it's true. The institutions are loaded against men, and yeah. anyone who speaks out against that gets howled down and possibly could lose their job. Yeah. So there's an environment of fear that's loaded against the truth. Yeah. And what about... I, mean, <laughs> I noticed you also been talking about... Um, the issue of sexual consent, you're worried about the sexual consent courses being taught in universities. Well, I think it's an insult to young men. These are the best and brightest of our people, who've, uh, young people who've got through to university and what they don't know the meaning of the word consent and they've mm. got to do stick figure courses to qualify, to get access to their results, to graduate. Yeah. It's an insult to them. And again, it's all based on propaganda. The uh, Hunting Ground uh, mm. project came here uh, it influenced the Human Rights Commission to do the surveys that you've discredited. You've pulled all the data apart to show that, in fact, universities are one of the safest places. Indeed, the safest place for women in our society. So far from being a, a rape culture, they're safe havens, relatively, for women in our society. So the idea in that environment, people have got to do a consent course before they can even go on to be university graduates, I think is an insult to the young men. And again, it's propaganda instead of truth. And look what they've done trying to stop me speaking on campuses. Well, and yeah. that's right. And, and their tactic is to stop a truth teller yeah. from even going to a campus to talk about it. One of the anomalies in the system, universities are federally funded, but they're legislated, they're, they've got their statutory base from state parliaments. Mm -hmm. So at some stage here, I'll be putting forward um, uh, legislation. So universities have got to live by a charter of free speech. Good. And we've seen that in American University. I think it's Chicago University. It's Chicago. Got the Charter of Free Speech. Yeah. We should have it here, here in the in the in the way in which universities are run. And the people who cause the protest and generate the need for security, they should pay the bills, not the speaker. Well, one other thing I'd like you to follow up, Mark, is the issue of the introduction into universities of regulations to adjudicate rape on campus, which is where this whole protest is heading. I mean, this whole rape crisis is designed to get universities involved in adjudicating well, rape Well, they cases. shouldn't. This is That's plainly really wrong. really dangerous. Uh, the police are there uh, for investigation. The courts are there for um, prosecution and conviction if needed. And universities can't set themselves up as uh, judge and jury. Well, that's what they're doing. No, it's wrong. And Sydney no, University's I'm... done it. I wrote to every member of the, the Senate of the university a couple of months ago. Not a single response well, from anybody. Well, you know, the people running university haven't got the training yep. to be um, in, investigators. Uh, they haven't got the, the, the background, the legal background to be prosecutors. And they're certainly not in the status of judge and jury to pass decisions on people. And we, uh, we have no decisions on people. control over what they're no. doing or who, who's making these decisions. No, well, we, we, we've no got proper a... due process rights for the accused. Yep. Um, I've already done two interviews with young men who've been had their whole uh, university derailed by this sort of inquiry. 
Well, I've, sure I've got a hundred issues. I'm cranked up. Put that on working. the list. Well, that, that, that's one of them. I'm aware <laughs> of it, and and I will be taking action because it's just plain wrong. And again, it's a triumph of ideology over evidence and, and the proper role of a university, which is to educate young people, uh, not to set themselves up as a quasi-judicial system. Yep. Well, Mark, we're very happy to have you there. I hope you're going to be able to recruit some other good people on side. Well, there's some good people here, but they are scared. You know, we live in an environment of fear publicly, but it's an eight year term. And I always say to people, I've got oh, eight that's... years of work. It's a long term. But I've, there's eight Fantastic. years of issues to try and sort out. You know, yeah. it's a massive problem in our institution. So, you know, I'll be working as hard as I can to try and correct it. Well, a lot of people were very happy to see you elected and to see our federal government stay in place. So let's hope we can have some progress on some of these issues. Yeah, we've got some green shoots. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to grow them big time. <laughs> we do. Thanks very much, Mark. A pleasure. Thank you, Ben. <laughs>